Well, good morning again. It's good to see everybody. You know, uh, last week Tim brought us a lesson on uh, resolve, on resolutions. And it's at this time of year, as we've ended one year, and generally, a lot that I, that I hear at work uh, mainly is, boy, am I glad this year's over. Am I, I'm so looking forward, 2019's got to be better than 2018. Has that ever crossed your mind? And we're at that, we're at that point in our lives. But it's also a very exciting time because we're beginning a new year. And we have a new theme. KGGS. Everybody knows the acronym WWJD. What would Jesus do? I want to present to you a new acronym this morning. KGGS. Know, grow, go, show. And along with that, as part of know, each, each uh, ca category, if you will, each subject, has been broken down into three uh, subjects as well. Know God, his word, each other. Grow in wisdom, in grace, and in our relationships. Go doesn't take a whole lot of explanation. Evangelize, serve, glorify. And then show your influence, stewardship, and forgiveness. That's what we're going to be concentrating on this year. Paul, Jeff, and I are very excited about this theme. We're very thankful. One of our sisters of our congregation is the one that suggested this theme. And as soon as we saw it, heard it, we all knew this is, this is the one that we were going to use. So we're very excited about that. I get to kick it off this morning. Um, with no, and we're going to be talking about knowing God. We're going to be talking about knowing his word, and we're going to be talking about knowing each other. If you'll notice, uh, there will be some things that come up afterwards, but we, we have symbols for each one of the, uh, our topics. For no, You'll see it's the red, it's in the, it's in the red background with an open Bible. For grow will be a green background with a plant. And then for go, it will be a blue, the navy blue background with the world. And then for show is a, is a yellow background with the sun. And hopefully as we go through, uh, each week of 2019, we will keep all of this uh, in mind and look forward to 2019 is going to be greater than 2018. That doesn't mean that 2018 was not good, but 2019 will be better. And hopefully that's the optimism that we show as we go forth. So as we get into know, knowing God, you know, there are a lot of people that say, I know God. Do they? Do you? What does it mean to know God? And I know we spent some time here recently in the uh, Galatians class in the auditorium uh, on that. And we'll go back and touch on that again, but we won't get too repetitive as far as what we talked about in class. But what does it mean to know God? If you, if you go to Thayer, on page 117, he describes it as to become acquainted with or to know. On the online Bible dictionary, it defines it as to know, understand, perceive, have knowledge of. And that's what we want to talk about when it comes to know. We want to talk about having knowledge of but not just having knowledge of, to understand as well. Why is this important? 
In John 17, verse 3, Jesus says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's why it's important. In 2 Thessalonians, the first chapter, not only do we need to know that, through, that knowing God is our avenue to eternal life, just the opposite is true. In, first, in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 8 and 9, it reads, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So in short, to know God means to have knowledge of God, but it also means to have a relationship with God. But there's more involved than just simply having a relationship with him. Knowing God that means having a relationship that's based on understanding. It's a relationship that's based on an understanding of God. In John 8, verse 19, the Pharisees had knowledge of God, but they didn't understand nor had fellowship with the Father or the Son. In John 8, verse 19, then they said to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. In John 15, where Corey just read from, verses 18 through uh, 21, Jesus is saying, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Do you think knowing the Father was important to Jesus? Because they do not know him who sent me. Jump down to chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues, Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Starting to get a picture that knowing God and Jesus is kind of important. In fact, that's one of the reasons why Jesus came to this earth was so that he could reveal the Father to us. That he could reveal God to man. In John 1, verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Jesus came to this earth to declare God to man. Colossians 1, and verse 15, it reads, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Jesus came to give man a clear manifestation, a clear picture of God. This is essential. For until one has a knowledge of God, we cannot know God. Until we come to a knowledge 
of God. There's no way we can know him. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Sounds pretty elementary. But we always stress the knowledge, but not the knowing. When we know Christ, we know the Father. In John 14, beginning in verse 6, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it will be sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, say show us the Father? Before we can know Christ, and when I'm talking about no, I'm talking about the part about entering into a relationship with him. Hopefully we've already got the knowledge of Christ. But now to come to know Christ and enter that relationship with him, we must learn of him. In John 6, in verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. To have a relationship with the Father, to know God, we must first learn about him. How do we learn about God? All we have to do is look around. That's the first place to start. Look around. Especially in the neck of woods that we're in. In Romans 1, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. In Acts 14, verse 17. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. So we can see God in all around us. We can see God through his divinity. But we can also come to know the Father, to know God, through the revelation of his will. And that happens to be the second part of knowing. First part, to know God. Have a knowledge of God, that through that knowledge of God we come to know God. We enter into a relationship with him. We enter into that relationship with him because we have an understanding of what knowing God is all about. And the second part is his word. In 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 1, and then we'll jump down to verse 13. But 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1, and then 13. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Paul is stating here that that was one, that not one of, that was his primary purpose, was to declare the testimony of God. Now we'll jump down to verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 2. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. It requires an understanding of spiritual things. It requires an understanding of knowing which is which. Because in Romans 1, verses 21 and 22, it says, because... Although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became foolish. We have to know and to be able to discern what is and what isn't. And the only way we can do that 
is by knowing his word. You know, it's, it's, it's often stated and often quoted, study to show yourself approved unto God. And I hate, uh, I, I no, not hate, I hesitate to go too far into that because that's going to be part of what we're going to talk about in show. But it seems that the world has this understanding or this belief that the way that you show a knowledge of God's word is by how many scriptures you can quote. What you talking about, Willis? Unfortunately, a lot of people that can quote scripture from memory, people look at that person like, wow, that person knows God's word. No. Don't get me wrong. We need to be able to have an answer for uh, the hope that's within us. We do. And the more that we know God and have a relationship with him and the understanding of that, and then the more we spend in his word, we will have that. Okay? But if you would, turn over to 2 Thessalonians 1. To know God means to have an understanding of God coupled with obedience. There needs to be obedience. We know God when we obey him. When we obey him, we show that we know God. In 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 8, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God. And on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's enough incentive for me. Hope it is for you. In 1 John chapter 2. Now by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him but whoever keeps his word truly the love of God is perfected in him by this we know that we are in him he who says he abides in him ought also to walk just as he walked it requires action on our part and that action is to obey his word. Not to obey. Oh, okay. I'll take that one and that one. No way I can do that one. But I know God. We need to obey his word. When we keep his commandments is the beginning of the relationship that we have with him. The relationship is formed when we keep his commandments. If you would, turn to John 14. So remember, the relationship that we seek, hopefully we seek, the relationship is formed when we obey him. John 14, verse 23. Jesus has answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. In 1 John 2, verse 3 that we read, was that part about the relationship and the keeping of the commandments? But also look at verse 5 of 1 John chapter 2. Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. So if we keep his word, we have the love of God in our lives. Look at verse 6. He who says he abides in him ought also, him also to walk just as he walked. In fellowship with God, we are in fellowship with God 
when we walk as Christ did. To jump down to the fourth chapter of 1 John. When we know God, we also accept the apostles' teachings. In 1 John 4 and verse 6, we are of God, he who knows God hears us, he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. It is a contradiction to say that we are pleasing God if we reject his inspired message. Second John, verse 9. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. So can you see how it's a contradiction to say we are, that we please God if we reject his word? The writings of the New Testament uh, writers throughout instruct us how to walk, live, as Christ walked or lived. In 1 John 1, verses 3 and 4, that which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. I know this all seems fairly uh, familiar to all of us. But as we begin our, our theme for this year, and in the knowing, we need to start from the beginning. Each one of these you can look at uh, as, a, as a natural progression, if you will, to know, have the knowledge of God, to truly know God, and the way to get that understanding and the relationship with him is through his word, obedience to it, to live as he lived. And everybody probably, that's, that's, that's great. I'm there. I'm there. But then to know each other. Oops. Forgot about that one. I don't know if I can do that one. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm not that much of a, of a social person. I'm really not. And yet I'm in sales. It's kind of a contradiction right there. To know God is to know our brethren. And it's just as important as knowing his word. Because if we truly knew his word, knowing our brethren, loving our brethren, having love for one another, is a no-brainer. Because it's a natural thing that we would do. Because that's what God showed us. But to know God means to be in Christ. You can't know God if you are not in Christ. In 1 John 5, verse 20, And we know that the Son of God has come and, and has given us an understanding, that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true. In his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. We cannot know God if we reject his Son. 
and to accept his son means that we are to be baptized into him through faith. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. We could all probably quote that by memory. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. But the final thing I'd like for us to look at is when we've got the knowledge and then we come to the understanding and through that understanding it leads to an obedient relationship we need to know that God knows us. God is acquainted with everything about us. Our actions, our thoughts, our very words. In the 139th Psalm, Psalm 139, the first four verses, the psalmist pens, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. God knows us. The part that we talked about in the Galatians class In Galatians 4, beginning in verse 4, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. But then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather, are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you would desire again to be in bondage. You know, I, I, I hesitate to say that this is one of my favorite passages because, just because of the, uh, the very nature of the passage itself, you wouldn't think that it would be a favorite passage. But it's one that we reference a lot. And if you could read my mind, you would have returned to Matthew 7. Beginning in verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are raven ravening wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. That's important to know. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Doesn't that count for anything? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 
We talked about how important it is when you to know God to be in obedience to him. And through that obedience to him, we form that relationship with him. Jesus just explains right here that process or the lack thereof. When Jesus said, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you, I never had a relationship with you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You're not following my word. But even with all of that, we know that God loves us. He knows us, and he loves us. 1 John 4, verses 9 and 10. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. He still loves us in spite of our sins against him. Just a quick thing about his word, and then we'll conclude on knowing his word. Why is it important to gain a knowledge of God's will? Have you thought about that? When we know God's will, it allows us to know what he requires of us and what he requires us to avoid. The psalmist wrote uh, in Psalm 1, 1 and 2, that he was able to find or was able to avoid walking as the ungodly, walking as a sinner, or walking as a scornful. That came through a knowledge of his will. But to know God's will also helps us to mature as a child of God. The writer of Hebrews, you all know who I think that was, but the writer of Hebrews admonished his readers because of their spiritual regression. He wrote, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. That's found in the fifth chapter, 12th verse of Hebrews. As we gain knowledge, we have opportunity to exercise our spiritual senses to discern both good and evil as is found in Hebrews 5.14. But not only that, a knowledge of God's will gives us an answer for Satan when he entices us. All I have to do is direct you to Matthew 4. When Jesus was in the wilderness and was tempted, what did he do in all three occasions? It is written. We need to have an answer, a defense, when Satan entices, entices us. But probably the most important, knowledge of God's will builds our faith. We can never reach the pinnacle of faith. And knowing his will, knowing his word, helps us build that. We we'll always go to Romans 10, 17. You probably already said it in your minds. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. There's all sorts of other things that could be cited. We just simply don't have enough time for. But in each case, consider that the knowledge we gain is, a, is the means to an end. When we study, we should do so to gain knowledge of God's word. 
We may not understand it completely, but that's still no reason to doubt. We know that Jesus is God's Son. We know that the Bible is God's Word. The gaining of knowledge will serve to strengthen our faith and remove our insecurities. This should be the healthy and right attitude that we take as we seek awareness of God and his will. Think of it this way. Don't study to gain knowledge for knowledge's sake. Study to show yourself approved to God. Do you know God? Perhaps you know about God, but do not really know him. Have a relationship with him. As when we say to know God is to have that relationship with him. We read in Galatians 3, 26 and 27, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Have you put on Christ? As we go through our theme, um, for this year. And the, uh, some more is going to be said about it here in just, in just a little bit on just exactly what uh, the plan uh, unfold, unfolding throughout the year. But as you go through this, don't, don't look at it from the standpoint of, oh, what's our theme meeting today? Don't look at it from that from that standpoint. Well, that's, that's looking at it in a very impersonal way. The first three months of this year, January is going to be devoted to knowing God's word, or to knowing God. February, to knowing God's word, as far as the scriptures go. And then March, on knowing each other and loving each other. When you do this, look at it from that standpoint. Even if you're convinced in your mind that you have that relationship with God, can you not improve on that relationship? Husbands and wives, when they became, become one, a relationship is formed. Is that the end? Does that relationship improve? whether you're just newly married or whether you've been married for 40 years. Has that, has that relationship not improved? Look at it from that standpoint. Be excited about our theme for this year, as we are. And may we all come to the understanding, full understanding of God and his word. If you are subject to the gospel invitation in any way, we'd like to help you out this morning. If you wanted to begin that relationship, seeking that relationship with God, and you have not put on our Lord and Savior's name, you have the opportunity to do that yet this morning. And I would urge you to do that. Tomorrow may be too late. But if you're already calling uh, I've already answered that calling. Um, but maybe I've kind of stepped off the path for a minute. Catch my breath. There are things in your life that need to be taken care of, that need to be set right, that need to be set in order. You have the opportunity to do that this morning. And I would highly urge you to take care of that this morning as well. Tomorrow may be too late. Again, if you're subject to the gospel call in any way, we invite you to come while we all stand and sing.